Stormcock is another name for the type of bird called a missile thrush. This is large, aggressive and powerful, and it stands boldly upright and bounds along the ground. It's known for singing at the onset of and even through storms and bad weather, unlike most birds which seek shelter in such conditions. The poet's choice of bird to write about is relevant to the deeper meaning or message of the poem about showing persistence and strength through tough times. It becomes for the poet a symbol of spiritual strength and in fact the choice of tree, elder, is also significant because the cross of the crucifixion is said to have been made from an elder tree. This is very important when thinking about how the poem concludes by comparing the thrush to the archangel Gabriel, whose name means the strength of God. This is a long poem, so that means that most students are likely to make one of the most common mistakes when writing about it, which is not prioritising quotations so that you try to comment on every single line, which means that you're very unlikely to be able to get to the end of the poem. That's a big mistake because the examiner's report is clear that they regard the end of the poem as containing the most significant imagery for you to comment on. So this is just going to be a short video to demonstrate one route through the poem to help you avoid that mistake. As you should always do with any poem that you're writing about for the CIE exam board, whether seen or unseen, split the poem into three sections. The sections don't have to be of equal length. Instead, you need to think about turning points within the poem. So the first section is the opening two stanzas, which introduce the scene and introduce the thrush's song. You'll notice that these two stanzas comprise just one sentence, which runs from In My Dark Hermitage all the way down to Him By His Singing Glorified. This leaves the middle three stanzas, which describe the appearance of the bird rather than the sound of its song. Those comprise just one long sentence. And then the final section is the last two stanzas one sentence each, which reflect on the speaker's response to what the stormcock means. Once you've found your three sections and split the poem into them, then it's a good idea to choose a few of the best quotations from each section, making sure you cover the entire poem. It's a good idea to cover a range of points, thinking about imagery, in yellow, metre or rhythm in blue, rhyme in red, and also any interesting points about syntax or the way in which the lines of poetry interact with the grammar of the sentences in green here. If all you ever do is talk about imagery, then although you can get a lot of marks doing that, there's nothing really about your essay which deals with the poem as a poem because the same words could also be arranged as a passage of prose. So remember that writing about poetry as poetry requires that you attend, at least sometimes, to points about layout on the page. When introducing your essay, you should briefly outline what your main idea is for each of the poem sections, going through chronologically. Let's suppose that the question we're answering here is how the poet makes the stormcock striking. We begin by saying that the first thing described is how inspiring the song is. We then talk about the plumage being splendid and then at the end the spiritual significance the bird has for the speaker. We also make a point of adding in an extra sentence giving a personal response to the ultimate meaning or message of the poem. It's important that you try to think about what the meaning or message might be beneath the poem's surface to show that you are engaging with it on a more profound level. It's a good idea 
to refer to a detail from towards the end of the poem, in this case the comparison of the bird to the Archangel Gabriel, when pinning down its underlying meaning in your introduction. So start with a detail from the end. This is because the details at the end are likely to represent the climax of the poem. And if you think about the end first, then it's likely to lead you to the heart of the poem. Having given a response to the main meaning or message of the poem, we then explore how language is used to convey that meaning. Make sure your topic sentence for your first main paragraph shows that you're beginning at the beginning and then also refer to the wording of the question. Striking. The transition from the speaker groping for bread, which suggests confusion and uncertainty and hunger, to celestial food instead marks the movement from the physical to the spiritual, which is at the heart of the poem. The stormcock comes to symbolise a spiritual attitude towards life. This is because celestial means not just from the sky, but also heavenly or divine. The transition from physical to spiritual is made clear by the rhyme between bread and instead, which highlights this sense of a change in direction or focus. Looking for one thing, the speaker finds, to her surprise, another. Rather than commenting on the rhyme scheme of the whole stanza then, which is four cross rhymes here, aloof, roof, sound, ground, culminating in the couplet bread instead, we focus our attention on one specific detail, which is how the concluding couplet introduces the transition that is marked by the colon here, juxtaposing the darkness, seclusion and isolation of the speaker's experience before the bird song interrupts it. This sense of interruption is also emphasised by the metre on loud, loud, which is a spondy, S-P-O-N-D-E-E. -E. This is when you get two stressed syllables in succession. This is not what we expect given the meter of the poem which is normally alternating stressed and unstressed syllables. So two stressed syllables next to each other, loud, loud, reflects the idea of the forcefulness of the bird's song. Note how just as we did with rhyme here we're concentrating on one individual detail rather than generalising about the metre or rhythm of the poem as a whole. Chorister can just mean one of a flock of singing birds, but it also means a member of an angelic choir. Combined with celestial then, Chorister develops the sense of the thrush's spiritual importance and unfailing develops this further because it means both never coming to an end as in constant or continual but also not failing or giving way so it's about persistence and a stubborn or strong attitude remember the stormcock sings through storms the meaning being developed here is that hard times shouldn't break us. And a sense of the stormcock's energy and power is conveyed by the poet's use of a run-on line. Note how the verb, burst, is delayed. Right from the start here, for suddenly, close at my ear, loud, loud and wild, with wintry glee, the old unfailing chorister, so from here, to chorister is like the sentence is being charged up but not yet released 
we then get some tension hanging at the end of the line and then finally it's released on burst at the start of the next line. This is a way of drawing our attention to using the layout on the page, the sense of power and vitality that the bird song represents. You might also want to explore this idea of pride of poetry as well. There are more poems about birds than there are about any other animal in English poetry. And this is because not only can birds fly, making them symbolic of freedom and flights of the imagination, and not only are there a lot of kinds of birds, making them an interesting cast of characters, there's normally one for every occasion. In this case, the stormcock sings during storms. But also, birds can sing, which means that they are metaphors or symbols for poets themselves, because poetry is itself a kind of song. So just as the stormcock sings through storms, the poet too, by writing, by creating art through difficult times, is also, in her own way, singing a bit like a bird. There's no need to comment on this in the exam, but it's interesting that the poet actually wrote this while recovering from a can of paint exploding in her face and losing sight for about six weeks. Having explored your prioritised quotations, in this case these are three, what you should do is make sure that you finish your paragraph by bringing it back to the question you've been asked, using the key word to make sure that the relevance of your paragraph is clear. We then apply the same technique to the middle section of the poem, which is all about the physical appearance of the bird. The topic sentence, again, uses the key word from the question, how does the poet make the stormcock striking? And then we have a few prioritised quotations which are going to be analysed to form the main body of the paragraph. Throbbing suggests both passion and effort and energy, but also perhaps pain. This is a reminder that singing through life, which is what the stormcock becomes a symbol of for the poet, can involve a little bit of both. It's about vitality, but also suffering. It's no coincidence that the word broken is repeated three times in the poem. Once in each section. Broken roof in the first, broken roof in the second, and broken tile in the third. In many ways, the message of the poem is about being broken but not beaten. And in that connection, you should remember that the cross of the crucifix was made from the elder tree. The way in which the bird's feet grasp the elder spray suggests that it has a strong hold. This is because grasp means to seize and hold firmly. You might therefore contrast it with the way in which the speaker gropes for bread in the first section. Both grasp and grope are tactile and to do with holding, but groping is more tentative or uncertain. And grasping is just another example of the strength of the bird that inspires the speaker. The rhyme between finely laid and subtly made highlights the sense of the delicacy and beauty of the bird's appearance because finely can also mean subtlety. The speaker sees in the bird a sense of superior workmanship, intricacy and skill. There's a sense of divine artistry. The line about the scale, the sinew and the claw perhaps alludes to William Blake's poem The Tiger. 
and what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart and when thy heart began to beat what dread hand and what dread feet both poets explore the speaker's sense of awe in response to the wonder of the beauty of creation note how the poet manipulates the sound of the lines to further this impression strongly subtly scale sinew saw there's a sense of harmony and unity to the sound of the lines which reinforces our sense of how finely and subtly all the different parts of the bird have been put together normally in english we use a subject verb object structure to our sentences so when we get here i saw at the end that has been inverted because the standard way to write this would be i saw how strongly used how subtly made the scale the sinew and the claw were plain through the broken roof whereas here what the speaker sees the object of the verb saw comes before both the verb and the subject so this example of inverted syntax means that these details here scale sinew and claw are foregrounded that is another way of conveying how they strike the speaker making a powerful impression as with the first paragraph we want to make sure that we finish our second paragraph by bringing our comments back to the wording of the question how does the poet make the stormcock striking and a good way to do this here is to think about how the details we've explored culminate in the image of gold now that color is a symbolically resonant one the traditional symbol of solar light and therefore divine intelligence so it introduces the idea of the stormcock being a spiritual messenger that we can explore in the final section of the poem analyzing the last section of the poem we again make sure that we continue to refer explicitly to the wording of the question finally the poet makes the stormcock striking by exploring its spiritual significance and again we prioritize which quotations are most important there's no way with a poem of this length that you're going to be giving every detail equal attention. They're not all equally important. If you try to do that, you'll end up not having enough time to write about the ones that actually do matter. The main image from the first stanza of the third section is that of the thrush being full fed, despite the fact that February is a lean or harsh month. Now, the image of being full fed suggests the idea of nourishment or plenitude, which is also developed by the image of a feast. That, therefore, is a contrast to the hunger that we began the poem with when the speaker groped for bread. In the Bible, the feast portrays the ideal world. According to Christ, the kingdom of heaven is a place of feasting. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 8, 11. The book of Revelation also speaks of the marriage feast of the Lamb that will be celebrated at the end of history. So feasts are occasions that enact the proper harmony of man and man, man and creation, and in scripture man and god they involve fellowship and friendship enjoying and sharing in the fruits of the earth joy and peace and goodwill they embody the way things really ought to be the idea that there's a symbolic significance to feast shouldn't surprise us given that the poem began with a shift from bread to celestial food instead Although inspiring, the bird ultimately remains slightly mystifying to the speaker, though, 
and that is reflected by the half rhyme between live and contrive. There's a sense of ingenuity or cleverness in the bird's ability to sing through the storm. February, after all, is ultimately not the month of the Annunciation, which is when Gabriel was sent from God to the Virgin Mary. The date of the Feast of the Annunciation is the 25th of March. Just as the half rhyme, live and contrive, breaks the rhyme scheme of the poem to reflect this awkwardness, still in February contrive, metrically, also disrupts the trochaic tetrameter rhythm of the poem. Ultimately then, although Gabriel is associated with greatness, might and power, and although the stormcock is striking to the speaker because of its ability to display these qualities singing through the storm, these are also things that the speaker aspires to rather than easily possesses. So it's significant that we return in the final couplet to the central conflict of the poem between the ability and willingness to smile and the brokenness of the world. Remember that broken is repeated three times throughout the poem. Note how the syntax here, which emphasises the simile as bright as Gabriel, by placing it between contrive and to smile, draws our attention to the otherworldliness of the thrush's attitude. It's significant that after images of feasting and gold and Gabriel, the last line is dominated by elder, the wood that the cross was made from, and an image of brokenness. This reminds us that if there is any kind of spiritual consolation in the Stormcock's song, then it is a tough one to be won through suffering and struggle. But it is still hope nevertheless. Note how in the conclusion, I don't just repeat points I've already made elsewhere throughout the essay. Summative conclusions don't give the opportunity to impress the examiner with a final insight that develops your personal response to the poem. So instead, a better way to conclude is to focus on one particular detail that you think sums up your sense of why the poem matters, what its main meaning or message is on a deeper level. So here I focused on the significance of the elder tree and then related to this I've explored the idea of strength in adversity. So brief conclusions that develop an idea about one particular summative detail are a better way for you to give a personal response than just summing up points that you've already made. They force you to think about which detail is truly most significant for you. Remember, as we've been doing all the way through, to make sure that you refer back to the wording of the question.